This is like a classic country club, khaki wearing, let's go like, you know, drink mimosas and, you know, hang out at uh, Lululemon. Like those are the kinds of voters who are here. There are a lot of factors contributing to high expectations for Democrats in the 2018 midterms. Because this is also a referendum about me. But one factor that will be key to determining control of Congress is the vote of affluent white suburban voters. You would typically think of them as Republicans, but they seem to be moving further away from the new, more Trumpy GOP. The issues for these voters, what, what do they really care about and, and what is their view of national politics? They may have liked what the uh, Republicans did on the tax reform bill, but are just as concerned now about how the president is acting around trade and this escalating trade war with China. But there are some real concerns about the kind of leadership that we're seeing out of this president, and they want a check on that chaos. Those concerns about Trump are showing up in the polls. In a recent political poll, Dems are up eight points over Republicans with suburban voters. That's a huge swing from the 2016 election when this voting bloc voted 49% to 45% for then-candidate Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. And two closer-than-they-should-be congressional races are perfect examples of this change, Virginia's 10th district and Texas's 32nd. First stop, VA-10, where incumbent Barbara Comstock I want a strong national defense. Keep us safe. Is attempting to hold off Democrat Jennifer Wexton. I approve this message because we're not done yet. Comstock first won the seat in 2014 by 16 points, but public polls show she's one of the most vulnerable Republicans this year, currently trailing Wexton by high single digits. But the National Republican Campaign Committee isn't really showing any concern. She's running a strong campaign, um, and we're excited, you know, about, about her chances. And Comstock's chances will largely be influenced by President Trump's policies and popularity in the district, which doesn't really bode well for Comstock if Wexton is able to ride the current Democratic enthusiasm to D.C. In 2016, Trump lost Prince William and Fairfax counties by 21 and 36 points respectively. Both are at least partially in the 10th district. Despite that though, Comstock was able to win her re-election that year. Republicans think that story will repeat in this year's race, pushing Comstock as an independent voice. And Barbara Comstock stands up to the president when he adversely affects their district or when she disagrees with him. She is not someone who just votes party line. That distancing is harder to sell for the GOP this time around. Comstock votes with President Trump almost 98% of the time something Democrats are constantly highlighting. Your vote is your voice when you're in Congress, and she has voted with the president more than any member of the Virginia delegation, which includes some pretty conservative folks. Technically, Comstock is tied for first with Virginia Rep Scott Taylor, but you get the point. Jennifer Wexton, on the other hand, is really leaning into being a check on the president. Democrats hope the residual effects of Democratic excitement and rejection of Trump that flipped more than a dozen delegate seats and kept the governor's mansion blue last year continue into this oh, election. Gosh, there are a few regions that I work in that are more energized and organized and professional and, and they just they understand the mission that they are on. Now, if you head down south to the suburbs outside of Dallas, incumbent Pete Sessions they're after me this time. Is battling Colin Allred. Let's make a difference together. It's a race the Republicans shouldn't really have trouble winning, but a recent New York Times poll shows they are neck and neck. He's somebody who has for a very long time represented this district and represented well enough so that people like him. But that popularity hasn't stopped Sessions from falling victim to the same Trump backlash plaguing Comstock. All red, a relative unknown, is within striking distance of Sessions. But it's that unknown quality that the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee thinks is helping Allred's case with these voters. When you have a fresh face local like Colin Allred, who can tell a story about being from the district, grew up in the district, and has such a tremendous opportunity to present a fresh, independent face here in Washington, D.C. Republicans aren't ignoring the numbers, but they're hoping to use that inexperience and Allred's progressive plans to paint him as wrong and too far left for Texas. There has never been a Democrat um, you know, in the seat that has run on such a progressive platform. Um, and you, know, you have somebody who has gotten results for the district. 
And you know, I think that's what's going to drive people back, you know, to, to vote for Pete Sessions at the end of the day. That drive back to Sessions is further complicated by the fact his district swung from solid Republican to voting for Hillary Clinton by two points in 2016. That and the Trump factor put Sessions in a really tough position of trying to hold together a base of Trump voters who love the president while also trying not to alienate these suburban voters. It's rare that a group of voters all vote the same way, but affluent suburban voters are really turned off by the current national politics and President Trump. And that could have a serious effect on districts like these come election day.